Hello everyone, and welcome to Shimadzu's Theory and Key Principles series. This is one in a series of lectures focusing on gas chromatography. The key topic for today will be GC columns. For this session, I'll be your presenter. My name is Andrew Clissold, and I'm the GC manager for Shimadzu in the UK. This is session two in our Theory and Key Principles series on gas chromatography. If you missed the first session, don't worry but I would recommend you watch episode one before starting this one. You can watch all previous sessions on demand by visiting our website. So, as I mentioned at the start, this lecture will focus on GC columns. Please also join us over the coming weeks, where we'll be further developing our knowledge and understanding of GC. We'll be discussing various injection techniques, detectors, data processing, as well as maintenance and troubleshooting. In this presentation, we'll be focusing on the major types of GC column available today, including packed and capillary. We'll also be looking at the various column dimensions and what they mean for your chromatography. Finally, we'll focus on the range of column phases available and how they relate to different applications and different temperature ranges these phases can be used at. So to begin the technical content of this lecture, we first need to look at the two main types of column. Column technology has evolved significantly over the past 50 years. The very first GC columns were relatively crude in design. They typically consisted of a metal tube about 1 8 or 1 quarter inch thick, that's about 3 to 6 millimetres for you younger folk, packed with a solid material. Although early packed columns were made of metal, glass and other materials were also employed. Later versions used this solid packing material as a support for a liquid stationary phase which allowed for a broader range of stationary phases to be employed. Here's a picture of some pack columns. These ones are made of glass so you can see the white packing material inside. Pack columns typically contain something called diametaceous earth, a naturally occurring substance that is useful for having a small particle size and hence a high surface area. This will be coated with whatever stationary phase is required before being packed into the column shell. Pack columns are quite robust, but typically do not give great peak shape. Peaks tend to be broad and give, by modern standards, quite poor sensitivity. However, they are still very popular in applications requiring the separation of small ambient gases. Over time, the design of columns was refined, particularly with the advent of silica capillary columns in the 1970s. These abandoned the large, bulky metal tubes for longer, thinner tubes made of fused silica a brown tinted glass-like material that isn't quite as brittle as glass, allowing it to be manipulated into position within the column oven. These tubes again allowed for the housing of a variety of stationary phases, some liquid, some solid and some blends. The term capillary column technically applies to several types of column, but in common usage it refers to the most popular style, which contains a viscous liquid coating of a stationary phase, supported on the inner wall of the silica. The correct name for a capillary column is a wall-coated open tubular column, or WCOT for short. Odds are, if you open your GC oven today, it's a WCOT column you'll find inside. PLOT and SCOT columns are variations on this design, but critically, they still maintain the core concept a long, narrow, open tubular design with a stationary phase being coated and supported on the inner walls. So as indicated, wall-coated open tubular columns now represent the bulk of columns in use today. The key advantage of these is the use of a liquid stationary phase. This offers significantly higher resolving power than the former pack columns and generally gives much sharper peaks. It also allows for columns to be made in narrower dimensions, the benefits of which we'll discuss later. Although you may not come across plot columns very often, it's worth understanding the difference between them and the common capillary column. Porous layer open tubular columns have more in common with pack columns, in the sense that their stationary phase is actually a solid. They offer very good resolution, but in certain applications. This porous layer is highly suitable for separating small molecules, particularly ambient gases. They aren't, however, very useful for larger molecules, typically anything over five carbon numbers, 
larger than this and the molecules either don't dilute from the column or do so so slowly they are too broad to be of practical use. As you may have gathered, the key message here is that capillary columns offer better chromatography, but what do we mean by better? Usually what we're talking about is the ability for a column to separate peaks. The higher the separating or resolving power, the more useful a column would be to the analyst. And because capillary columns are very narrow and very open, they have a very high resolving power, meaning they can separate peaks much more effectively than their packed counterparts. This is important. When we calculate how much of a compound is in a sample, we rely on the accurate determination or integration of the area of a peak in order to translate that into a quantity. So, since capillary columns offer better baseline resolution, the software or the analyst can more accurately calculate the amount of substances present in the sample. This obviously has more important ramifications when calculating, for example, the concentration of alcohol in a suspected drink driver's blood. If we cannot accurately quantify the concentration of alcohol, we could wrongly report a false positive or false negative result. In fact, the difference between capillary and pack columns is usually at least tenfold. The high separating power means that fewer phases are required. While historically there have been hundreds of different packing materials used for GC, often with at least two different materials needed to separate relatively simple mixtures, a wide range of applications using capillary columns can now be achieved using just a handful of stationary phases. As you may have gathered from the discussion so far, capillary columns have become the standard in GC, and hence we'll be focusing on them from here on. In order to appreciate the differences between capillary columns, it's important to understand their key dimensions. When selecting a column, besides the choice of stationary phase, the actual dimensions make a huge difference to performance. The important values to consider are the length, the internal diameter, and the thickness of the stationary phase. These parameters, combined with the choice of carrier gas and the oven temperature, determine the overall separation. The next time you're near your GC, take a look at the GC column. Almost all columns these days come with a metal dog tag attached that gives you a complete description of its physical properties. This information is usually repeated on the box the column arrived in and is likely logged in your GC operating software as well. Unfortunately, like so many things in science, this description is written in a form of cryptic shorthand. On this slide is a typical description found on a GC column. The first value shown usually refers to the manufacturer's name in this case, RTX is short for ResTech. Other popular codes would be DB for Agilent, BP for SGE Columns, and ZB for Phenomenex. The brand of the column is not too important. The most important value is actually what comes next, the phase type. This value gives you an indication of the chemical properties of the column. The most common phase that's referred to is a 5%, as seen in this example. Sometimes this number also has some additional letters, indicating the column is for a specific purpose, in this case for use with a mass spec. Don't worry too much about the phase just yet, as we'll discuss this in more detail later. For now, you just need to understand that the type of phase affects the order of elution, and the type is usually referred to by a number, like 5, 10 or 50, or a short monogram, like WAX or FFAP. The next value is the length of the column in metres. Typical lengths are between 5 and 50 metres, with 30 being a standard size. Next is the internal diameter of the column in millimetres. The largest diameter is 0.53 millimetres, with 0.25 being the most common. Finally, we have the film thickness. This is partially related to the column diameter, as wider columns allow for thicker films. Let's take a moment to see what effect these different dimensions would have. The easiest one to start with is length. By making the column longer, the resolving power of the column is increased. It's not a linear effect, however, and while doubling the length of the column would increase resolution, it would not double it. You should also bear in mind that longer columns retain peaks for longer, and hence make for a longer, slower method. It's also worth mentioning at this point that, largely speaking, the longer a compound stays on the column, the broader its peak becomes. This is because compounds tend to spread out or broaden as they travel. 
the shorter its time spent on the column, the less broadening the compound will do. For an example, compare peaks 1 to 5 in this first chromatogram versus peaks 9 and 10. Peak broadening is important because it has implications in both sensitivity and resolution. As peaks broaden, they flatten out, moving further and further towards the baseline. This means it becomes more difficult to differentiate the start and end points of a peak, which reduces the accuracy of your integration. Eventually, if a peak broadens enough, it becomes impossible to identify it at all. Secondly, if there are any other peaks nearby, these begin to merge into one another, resulting in what we scientifically call a bit of a mess. At this point, it becomes almost impossible to determine where one peak starts and another finishes. So how does the internal diameter of a column affect the resolving power? Well, there's a relatively simple way to explain. Think of one of those penny machines you used to see in old arcades and pubs. The pennies, which represent the molecules of the compound, always move in the same direction, but jump around along the way to the bottom. If we make 50 pennies drop at the same time, some will drop straight through and others will take a longer path. The time between the first penny landing and the final penny landing is, in effect, our peak width. Now imagine if we made the penny machine much narrower. There are fewer pathways that each penny can take. This means that the time between the first and last penny landing is now much smaller, giving us a narrower peak. And if we drop the same number of pennies in both machines, the number of pennies dropping at any one time would be much higher, hence a taller peak as well. Moving away from the analogy, we can now see how the column diameter affects the peak shape. The more molecules reaching the detector at a given time results in a higher signal. The total area, number of pennies, is the same, but it's squeezed together into a taller peak. In recent years, you might have heard the term fast chromatography. This is a term that groups together various improvements in GC, one of the most significant of which was the development of ultra-thin GC columns, with an internal diameter of just 0.1 mm versus the more standard 0.25. Because the inner diameter is so thin, the resolution is dramatically improved, so much so that we can achieve the same or better separation on a 10 meter 0.1 column versus a 30 meter 0.25 column. As we've already said, the shorter a column, the faster the analysis time. So these offer significant improvements to organizations wanting to analyze lots of samples in a short space of time. So why doesn't everybody use narrow columns, I hear you ask? Well, a capillary column only has a few milligrams of stationary phase inside. So whilst a packed column can handle concentrations in the percent level, capillary columns can only effectively handle concentrations in the part per million range or below. As we continue to reduce the inner diameter from 0.25 to 0.1, the available surface area of stationary phase is reduced. The outcome is that Add too much compound onto the column, and you end up with a peak that overloads the column and is distorted. See peak number 3 in this example. For very narrow bore columns, the volume you can inject and the concentration of compound within your sample start to become a very limiting factor. An experienced analyst can understand these concepts and can adjust the methods accordingly. Finally, we have film thickness. Thicker films retain compounds for longer, because there's more of it to interact with. A thicker film is best used for compounds that are very volatile and would normally elute quite quickly and not be well separated. Things like methanol, vinyl chloride, dichloromethane, etc. Conversely, heavier, higher boiling compounds are more practical for thinner films as these compounds take much longer to travel through the column. These are crucial when analysing very heavy oils and waxes where compounds with carbon numbers are up to around 100 or even 120. Now at this stage you're probably thinking, crikey, that's a lot of information, how on earth will I pick a column? Well, don't worry, if you're not sure which column to choose, then use this chart as a rough guide. It's in no way exhaustive, but gives an indication of the range of dimensions that are available, and what typical applications we'd use them for. There's a good chance this first column will do the job, a 30 by 25 by 25 it's the most commonly used column and is suitable for the vast majority of applications. It sits in the middle in terms of length, internal diameter and film thickness.
For applications that require good separation of volatile compounds, a significantly thicker film would allow for better peak separation. A common application for this would be the analysis of volatiles in wastewater. These applications typically employ a different injection technique called headspace, but we'll cover that in a later session. For semi-volatile species that are approaching the limits of GC analysis, a shorter column with a thinner film offers less retention. The heavier components are loot in a reasonable time frame, and it prevents too much peak broadening. These column dimensions are commonly used when performing consumer safety tests for things like phthalates, which have very high boiling points. And finally, there are very short, very thin columns for fast GC analysis. As we've discussed, these are becoming more and more popular as organisations look to improve their sample throughput. So now we've covered the options of column size, it's time to tackle the last question when choosing a column, the choice of stationary phase. Having an understanding of the dimensions of the column is critical, but it's nothing if we don't also understand the stationary phase as well. For GC columns, the stationary phase, or film, can be described on a scale of polarity, from completely apolar to very polar. A system will give a much better peak shape and separation when the polarity of the sample is matched to the polarity of the stationary phase. As an example, alkanes, such as oils and greases, are very non-polar, so will typically separate well on a non-polar column. At the other end of the scale, very polar compounds, such as acids and alcohols, give significantly better peak shape and separation on very polar columns. There are a number of different phases available. As we said earlier, the numbering in the name of the column often refers to the stationary phase material. Most of the time, the larger that number, the more polar a column is. Be careful though, as there are some exceptions. A 624 column, for example, refers to an application number, not the polarity. As you recall from the last session, GC is best suited to less polar compounds, so it makes sense that a relatively non-polar column of 5% is the most widely used column and covers many applications. Much like our 302525 dimensions, the 5% is the go-to column for analysts developing a new method. Here are some common phases described in more detail. These are actually the names of the chemicals used in the phase. As you can see, more polar phases are geared towards more polar analytes. There are also a number of phases that work for particular elements or functional groups. Please don't feel that you need to know all this information. There are a number of GC column companies, including Shimadzu, that can guide you towards a suitable column based on only the minimum information about your sample. However, if you're a fan of organic chemistry, here are some of the structures of the stationary phases found in many columns. The phases themselves are actually polymers, usually, but not always, with a siloxane backbone. These silica-based polymers are often altered by appending them with functional groups. Changing the type of functional group and the frequency that they repeat across the polymer alters its chemical properties. The effect is the interaction between the sample and the stationary phase is changed. Column manufacturers will often use multiple functional groups in different ratios in order to create a column for new applications. One very important non-polysiloxane phase worth mentioning is polyethylene glycol. This is a very polar stationary phase and is often referred to as a wax column. It's well suited for the analysis of polar compounds such as alcohols and acids. One key takeaway message from this table is that as your polarity increases, the workable temperature that it can operate at begins to decrease. All columns have temperature limits. These shouldn't be exceeded, as doing so risks damaging the stationary phase. In extreme cases, excessive heating can also damage the fused silica backbone. For very high temperature applications, the fused silica is often replaced with metal to allow temperatures up to around 450 degrees. The temperature limits for a specific column are indicated on the box and are also often stated on the dog tag. There are two main temperatures listed. The lowest refers to the maximum isothermal temperature, that is, when the column oven is held at the same temperature for the entire analysis.
The higher temperature limit is the programmable limit. This is the limit that a column can be heated to when it starts at a lower temperature and gradually heats throughout the analysis. In this instance, because the final temperature is only maintained for a short period, it's safe to heat the column a little higher. Going beyond this temperature can damage the stationary phase, causing it to break away from the column wall. This is known as column bleed. Column bleed occurs whenever we heat a column and is the reason why the back end of the column's baseline tends to rise up. This is due to a small amount of phase coming away from the column as it heats up. The phase is picked up by the detector and the baseline rises. All columns bleed a little, and this is not necessarily a problem. As columns get older, the rate of bleeding tends to increase. Columns can be conditioned and try to extend their usable lifetime, usually by heating them close to their maximum temperature for an extended period. So there you have it, a basic introduction to GC column chemistry. Now let's look at everything we've covered and recap on the key points. We can categorise GC columns into two types, packed and capillary. Packed columns contain a packing material or porous solid, whereas capillary columns are hollow tubes with a coating. Capillary columns, specifically WCOT, are utilised far more in modern systems given their higher resolution. The columns have four key properties, length, inner diameter, film thickness and phase chemistry. Phases for capillary columns are described based on their polarity, from non-polar to polar. More polar phases often have a lower maximum temperature, so choosing a suitable phase can be tricky. There are a wide range of column phases available. If you're not sure which one to choose, ask an expert or refer to the literature. If you like this lecture and would like to see more, please do join us next time. The next episode will be looking at the sample introduction and the importance of the split injection. All the information on our webinar series can be found on the Shimadzu UK website. That's all for me and thank you for listening. Excellence in Science, Shimazu.